Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to look at the evolution of our ideas about God. With me is Richard Smoley, who is the author of How God Became God, what scholars are really saying about God in the Bible. He is also the editor of Quest, the journal of the Theosophical Society in America. In addition, he is the past editor of Gnosis Magazine and author of many other books, including Inner Christianity, The Guide to the Esoteric Tradition. Hidden Wisdom, The Guide to the Western Inner Traditions. The Dice Game of Shiva, How Consciousness Creates the Universe, and many other books. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Glad to be here. I think it's fascinating to consider the Bible, which many people believe to be the Word of God, as a product that uh, evolved over time and that ideas about God uh, evolved over time as, as well. Uh, if one were to go back, let's say, 2,000, 3,000 years to the days when the, the texts that are now part of the biblical canon were written, people understood the idea of God very differently than it is taken today. Yes, and one important way in which it differed, uh, particularly in the milieu in which the Hebrew Bible was written, was that there was this concept of a high God called El, mm -hmm. translated as God, mm -hmm. and there were various other subordinate national gods that is to say, a given people worshipped its own national god. You were supposed to worship your nation's god and not someone else's. Mm -hmm. uh, this didn't necessarily mean these other gods didn't exist. It just meant that um, they weren't for you. Mm -hmm. And this is the core of what later came to be called monotheism. Mm -hmm. Because as far as scholars seem to be able to tell, Yahweh, the name, proper name of the God of the Hebrew Bible. The proper English name, I suppose, is the, the Hebrew name is supposedly unpronounceable. Unpronounceable or unknown or mm -hmm. at least not disclosed. Yeah. But that's that's the usual pronunciation given. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, as far as can be told, he was originally the god of the Midianite League, a bunch of Canaanite tribes mm -hmm. in uh southeastern Jordan, northwestern Saudi Arabia by today's maps. Mm -hmm. And you will notice that Midian is the place where Moses encounters God uh, on Sinai. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jethro, his father-in-law, is also a priest of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So one very plausible theory is that this God was the God of the Midianite League, who appeared in some kind of theophany, God appearance, to mm -hmm. Moses. The burning bush. The burning bush, yeah. uh, who, it would seem, led a small group of slaves or refugees from Egypt into the hill country of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Now, that is kind of, I believe, the kind of core seed of the idea of the Exodus, although scholars do not believe that it happened on the scale that uh, uh, it is described. As, as I understand it, for example, uh, the walls of Jericho never came tumbling down all at once. The archaeology uh, excavations of the walls of Jericho show they, they came down gradually. Mm, yeah. Well, that's the whole thing. Uh, the Israelite tribes did, it would seem, migrate into the hill country uh, kind of uh, of Palestine mm -hmm. and lived there. Um, eventually, a monarchy was formed, and Yahweh was the god of this people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the covenant with Yahweh 
was what united these people together. They came from diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. some of them possibly uh, these slaves led by Moses, some of them uh, refugees from the Canaanite cities, mm -hmm. which were being destroyed at that time, mm -hmm. uh, Bedouins, uh, uh, nomads who decided mm -hmm. for whatever reason they wanted to settle down and lead a more agricultural life. And their uh, identity was not initially ethnic, so to speak, yeah. but it was a, 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 by this um, allegiance to Yahweh. Well, and, and I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that in the household of David, there were those who, who kept idols and uh, whose personal devotion was to their idols. Yes, um, although one thing about the whole story of David mm -hmm. and Solomon is that it is accepted as a lot less historically sound than it was, say, 40 years ago when I was in college. They weren't such great kings as we might imagine from the movies. Right. Why not? Well, if you had a kingdom like Solomon's, you would have, from that went from mm -hmm. Egypt to the Euphrates, mm -hmm. because that's what the Bible With says. With a thousand wives. A thousand wives. You would have left some artifacts. And there are no artifacts of that sort from that era. Mm -hmm. There's not one ivory comb from one of Solomon's wives. Uh, Solomon probably lived, but the, this kind of picture of his glory was, uh, to some extent, a later kind of nationalistic creation. Mm -hmm. David certainly uh, existed as well. There was a house that is dynasty of David. Yeah. Uh, that That is attested. Um, but to the extent that he was uh, anything, it, it, he probably was not more than a very powerful chieftain who united the tribes in a kind of basically personal alliance to him as a king. And in fact, if you take the biblical record seriously, he was something of a bandit. Yes, yeah, and that 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 certainly uh, that that certainly would fit in. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do know, uh, see, around the year eight hundred and fifty B.C. Mm -hmm is when the history uh, and archaeology of the period and the Hebrew Bible converge. Mm -hmm. And this was the time of King Ahab and his notorious wife Jezebel. Yes. Ahab was an extremely power. He, he was the king of Israel, the, the northern part of the kingdom. The southern part was called Judah, yeah. and it was much more insignificant. Uh, and yes, there was a there was a steely that said, you know, I went to war against Ahab of Israel and his two thousand chariots and ten thousand foot soldiers. And um, well, it's, it's, it seems that Ahab won mm -hmm. this particular thing. This is a steely from the other king. Mm -hmm. A steely is a standing stone with an inscription on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then there are stables of Ahab in Samaria. Uh, which was his capital. Mm -hmm. At this point, it starts to come a lot more into focus. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a few months ago, a seal was found um, that belonged to Hezekiah, who was king of Judah, the mm -hmm. southern kingdom. Mm -hmm. Well, the Hezekiah reigned about 700 BC. That's after the period I'm talking about. Yes. And, and so Hezekiah, yeah, that could well have been his seal. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it may have been something he personally used. So what you're saying is the biblical accounts can be taken to be more accurate starting at about that time. Yeah. And mm -hmm. after that, uh, before that time, um, it gets very, very um, legendary. Yeah. Um, now, if you talk about the God of Abraham, for example, Abraham traditionally was supposed to have lived around 1900 B.C. Yes. But no scholar, except for you know fundamentalists, uh, very very conservative fundamentalists, can find anything in the historical record that really relates to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. The names are actually characteristic of the period, which is the Middle Bronze Era, if you want to get technical. Mm -hmm. But not much else is, yeah. um, and you know so the relation to history, the stories about Abraham doing X, Y, and Z are. Um, symbolic or mythic or allegorical. But what you're saying is that the context that is described in uh, the book of Genesis for that 
time frame is, is relatively accurate. Yeah, but the specific pa- facts are not particularly uh, accurate. Or, or we don't have uh, the means of verifying them. Right. Or, and the, the little we have is, um, it doesn't exactly go with a Bible. Mm-hmm. There's an Egyptian uh, inscription from that period that mentions a Yaakov, Yaakov, which is Jacob. Mm-hmm. Well, this Jacob was a pharaoh. Mm. And there was a, a Semitic dynasty called the Hyksos who yeah. reigned in mm-hmm. that period, and Yaakov was one of their pharaohs. Mm-hmm. But this has nothing to do with the Jacob of the Bible. He only comes down um, you know, to Egypt as an old man after his son has made good down there. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, you know, he's it's like his, you know, his son is bringing him to like a retirement community or something. Mm-hmm. He wasn't a pharaoh. And even though the Egyptians kept very extensive records, their descriptions of uh, the Israeli, uh, the Israelites, uh, are almost uh, null, nothing. No, there were Canaanite tribes who yeah. settled, and and you know, and probably in uh, particularly the eastern part of the um, Nile Delta, which mm-hmm. is where you know a, the land of Goshen the, the Bible is supposed to yes. be so there's a general context mm-hmm. but um, it's it is general mm-hmm. uh, and only toward the end uh, and most of the Bible was written um, the Hebrew Bible was written after 700 BC yeah. um, there's very little else that uh, there were some things some of the prophets lived before that. no record of the ten plagues no, and those, you know, it, it's quite clear that those are uh, symbols, um, mm-hmm. you know, probably Kabbalistic images because relating to the ten spherot or principles of the Kabbalah. Mm. I mean, the Kabbalah is, is kind of the mystical tradition of Judaism, and you could well ask whether the Kabbalah is based on the Bible or the Bible is based on the Kabbalah because they do shed an enormous amount of light yeah. on each other. Well. I've done a little bit of biblical study in in my student days, and uh, one interesting thing that uh, has come up is that the one word that appears in the in the Jewish Bible more often than any other is in Hebrew. It's Mitzrayim. It means Egypt. <laughs> yes, <laughs> over and over and over again, Egypt mm-hmm. as a narrow place. Uh, yeah, Mitzrayim uh, etymologically means like the straits or the narrows. And, you know, if you've ever been to Egypt, I mean, you know, you, you're standing here on, on one side of the Nile Valley and there's a little green strip and then there's desert on the other and it really is narrow. Yes. Uh, so that, that makes sense. Now, Mitzrayim, Egypt, um, all, is, also has a spiritual meaning mm-hmm. and these allegorical spiritual meanings, I would say, in many ways are more important than the literal ones, which mm-hmm. is one of the points of my book. Yeah. And Egypt is always portrayed as a place of spiritual bondage, mm-hmm. specifically bondage to the material world. Mm-hmm. So that the Exodus is a story of spiritual liberation. Yeah. Now this is not a huge secret. I think if you go to any Passover Seder, at least anyone that I've ever been to, you know, this idea is present and, and referred to. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying it's much more uh, it's much more what the story is about than history. Well, I have to say, uh, as a, a Jewish person, I've been horrified, honestly horrified, by by that story that uh, God, the high God, all high, the the highest of all high gods, would want to murder the innocent firstborn children of the Egyptians. It's mm-hmm. it's one of the things, honestly, that has, has created real distance between me and uh, the Moses of the Bible. <laughs> In some ways, I think that's where Judaism took a wrong turn is with Moses. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't mean to be getting too personal about this. Let's talk about the the New Testament because I believe in in your book, uh, even though you suggest that that the Bible is largely accurate after about 800 BC, that that there's some interesting, um, can we say, symbols behind the whole uh, story of Christ. Yeah. Well, the historical problems of the New Testament are different from those of the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the historical context of Jesus it's firmly rooted in history. Yes. 
There's the second temple, as it's called. That's the temple where Jesus supposedly casts out the money changers. Mm -hmm. It's the temple's priests that contrive to have him killed. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the there was a Pontius yeah. Pilate. There are inscriptions that say Pontius Pilate, and mm -hmm. there are records. You know, yeah. so there isn't. There's a good deal less about Jesus personally in non-Christian sources for the simple reason mm -hmm. that um, he probably really wasn't that well known in his time. Um, so he, you know, there are not going to be inscriptions about Jesus because he yeah. wasn't a king, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a Roman official. Um, so the historical record is not going to is not. Um, does not cut that fine. But I uh, gather it's quite clear that there were many faith communities that uh, came in the wake of his death. Yes. And this is one thing that scholars have uh, shown, I think. Mm -hmm. um, up until a couple of generations ago, the official story of an apostolic church that taught the doctrines of, say, the Catholic and Orthodox churches today and the Protestant churches, which are uh, uh, their descendants, uh, you know, that's what Jesus taught the apostles. That's what they passed on. Mm -hmm. And then there are all these heresies that started to come up, like mm -hmm. the Gnostics, mm -hmm. uh, the Docetists, the Ebionites. They all have, you know, these names. And we, a lot of them we don't even know yeah. uh, apart from their names. But it doesn't seem like it was that way. It seems like these faith communities, as that's what they tend to be called, arose pretty much immediately after Jesus' time. If that's the case, to my mind, the, the most simple and logical explanation is that the apostles, disciples themselves, mm -hmm. understood Jesus' teaching in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And he may have emphasized different aspects of his teaching to them, depending upon their capacities and interests. Yes. Um, and only one of these, um, you know, eventually triumphed as the uh, Catholic Church. By the way, the disciples and the apostles are um, much, much more mysterious than Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. There's virtually nothing about them that can be taken historically mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Acts of the Apostles, which is uh, in the New Testament, is mostly about Paul. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we know a great deal more about Paul than probably any other single personality in any part of the Bible. We have his writings. Mm -hmm. We see his ideas. We see his hobby horses. Sometimes he seems to be thinking aloud on paper. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about him. Everybody else is kind of shadowy. Um, in any case, there was this Catholic Church that started, and it started to be called the Catholic Church in the second century, the Catholic meaning universal, mm -hmm. Catholicos in Greek. Mm -hmm. And it started to weave its doctrines, yeah. and some of these were things that the apostles and Jesus himself probably would not have uh, agreed with or even understood. So what, what you're saying is that uh, we have good reason to believe there was a human being named Jesus yes. that yes. would have been his... Greek name, I guess. Yes. Uh, who actually lived, who had uh, students or disciples, who found, was basically a guru type of person. Mm -hmm. And somehow, in, in the course of biblical history, his status became elevated to that of a deity. Yeah, well, that's interesting mm -hmm. because here's a standard scholarly picture from a couple of generations ago which is something like what you've described, that you know Jesus was progressively exalted. But the earliest evidence, mm -hmm. and the epistles of Paul are the oldest texts in the New Testament, not the Gospels, mm -hmm. um, suggest that he was seen as a semi-divine being, at least by some of his disciples, uh -huh. very soon after and possibly um, even during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, did he claim to be this? Well, we don't know, because some of the things in the Gospels are things that Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Some of them were probably added later. How can you tell the difference? Well, the criteria are a bit funny, but eventually uh, the scholars' preconceptions are operative. Mm -hmm. Because there's no there's no Jerusalem Daily Bugle from the year uh, 33 A.D. And but, if, if I understand it correctly, some scholars will get together and sort of vote on whether they think uh, particular statements were authentic or not. 
Yeah, that's the Jesus Seminar, and mm -hmm. that's probably, in a sense, the most radical of you know, real mainstream scholars. And, you know, they kind of leave us with a Jesus who, you know, he didn't really say too much that, you know, they're willing to accept. Mm. So this Jesus becomes a very, very shadowy figure. Yeah. I myself am willing to take the core story of the Gospels for, at face value. That is to say, there was a man named Jesus who started out his career by being baptized by John, mm -hmm. who was also a uh, known from other sources. He taught, he may have performed things that people thought of as miracles. He was crucified um, by the Romans at the instigation of the priests. Um, and it's a little, you know, people are rightly uncomfortable with saying that um, the Jews killed Jesus, but since Jesus, pretty much everybody Jesus knew was a Jew. It doesn't really very, including his disciples and his family. Mm -hmm. This isn't really saying too much. It's a little uh, more accurate, I would say, um, although a bit more disturbing to some, to say that it was the priests that killed Jesus, yeah. and the priests of the time were corrupt, mm -hmm. as we know from Josephus, a historian of the period who was himself of a priestly family. Mm -hmm. Now, there are these things in the thing. You know, there's a funny thing. Uh, that Jesus sometimes is called, and this is the Son of Man. Yes. And it, who this Son of Man is and what it means is rather uh, mysterious or has been. Well, you've done some interesting work on this question. Yes, and I, it's one of the more interesting things that I discovered, uh, although I, I didn't discover it uniquely, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, certainly piecing things together. Because... Uh, the son of man, well, it just, it just means a kind of an ordinary guy. But that's not how it comes across in the Gospels. You know, the priests are saying, you know, are you really saying you're the son of man? Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't, you know, they're not really asking, are you really saying you're just an ordinary guy? Well, there was a figure. Mm -hmm. uh, he was called the, the archangel of many names, as Philo, the Jewish philosopher of that era, called him. And some of these names were the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Lagos, the Word, it's starting to sound familiar. Yes. And this was seen, and this was in the Judaism of the era, quite mm -hmm. apart from Christianity. This yeah. is known and accepted. An angelic being. An angelic being who is referred to even as a, a kind of second God. Mm -hmm. And he, Josephus portrays him, says, well, he was neither created nor uncreated. He is a kind of link between the transcendent God and everything else. Sounds and, very Kabbalistic, actually. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And this figure, this great angel, did survive in the Kabbalah mm -hmm. uh, his, under the name Metatron. Mm -hmm. And Metatron is mentioned often. So, some of Jesus' followers, very early on, Maybe Jesus himself seemed to have thought he was the, this, the incarnation of this Son of Man, mm -hmm. who was not, the tr concept of the Trinity had not been invented yet. Right. Uh, it was kind of more a subordinationist view. Mm -hmm. But it's very possible that the idea of Jesus uh, as part of a divine trinity evolved from this notion of uh, th this angelic being. Yeah. That's probably what happened. He was also, I mean, part of the heavenly hosts. Well, the doctrine of the Trinity is first mentioned in the second century, um, uh, and it was apparently thought up by a, a Gnostic heretic called Valentinus, mm. who wrote a treatise called On the Three Persons the Father of the Father, Son, and um, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We don't know what this said because all we know is its title. Mm. And this is just one of the many mind-blowing things you find. It's like, the doctrine of the Trinity, the mainstay of orthodoxy, was this really thought of by someone who was later condemned as a heretic? I mean, it's just, it's, it's not only ironic and paradoxical, it's baffling. Well, all Gnostics were eventually condemned as heretics. Yeah, but a lot of their ideas weren't accepted and they weren't like put to the center of the Christian religion.
So this religion changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as I say, a lot of the things that were later said about Jesus and his disciples, probably none of them uh, would have recognized or understood. Well, what we've discussed in our earlier interview on Gnosticism is that it's, it's quite likely that many of the Gnostic teachings, later condemned as heresies, emerged directly from the earliest faith communities uh, and may have been principles taught by Jesus himself. What's interesting about a lot of these Gnostic heretics is that they actually are claiming an apostolic lineage. Mm -hmm. That is to say, um, Valentinus, who I mentioned, he said, well, I studied with this guy named Theodos, and he was a pupil of Paul's. Another Gnostic claimed to be taught by a pupil of Peter's. The apostolic, supposedly apostolic Christians at the time, they, they didn't say anything like this. Mm -hmm. Um, they didn't make any such direct claims. So you really have to wonder, you know, who is the authentic uh, uh, preserver of the teachings and who wasn't. Uh, whoever happened to win politically in the long run <laughs> is not necessarily uh, the most authentic. Uh, yeah. Because by the time the uh, doctrines were formalized and the Bible was, the canon was, uh, made official, the, the church was already uh, garnering political power. Yes. Now, scholars will generally say that the canon of the Hebrew Bible, as fixed by the rabbis, mm -hmm. was probably more or less in place by A.D. 100. Mm. The canon of the New Testament, uh, the first list of the New Testament books that are yeah. canonical, as we said in an earlier interview, are by an Athanasius, mm -hmm. Bishop of Alexandria in 367. Yeah. So the church existed and it shaped the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So it's funny if you're like, you know, you're an evangelical Protestant, the church was based on the Bible. Well, no, the church, it wasn't even a chicken and egg thing. It was like the church came first and then they decided what was going to be in the Bible and what wasn't. And in both instances, there's a large apocryphal literature, which yes. is uh, very interesting to give us a, a window into what people in, in those days were really thinking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, most of this apocryphal literature is accepted to be much later than the ones that were in the New Testament. Mm. The only exception is a text called the Gospel of Thomas, mm -hmm. which uh, is a sayings collection. Mm -hmm. Now, bef even before this was discovered in 1945, um, scholars are saying the earliest writings about Jesus were really these sayings collection. Oh. And that the, the, the evangelists who wrote the New Testament Gospels mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. these sayings collections and to create in, in them In other there. words, it's thought that they had a, a manuscript of these sayings. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, this Gospel of Thomas is one, a sayings collection. Mm -hmm. Now, it's probably not one that, that the writers of the New Testament used, but wow, that means this sayings collection could be older than the Gospels in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And it sound, it's generally considered a Gnostic text because yeah. it doesn't talk about um, blood redemption or, or salvation or mm -hmm. dying for sins or anything like that. It's very much about inner awakening. Mm -hmm. Could this be the oldest Christian text there is? Most scholars balk at that because they think, well, it's Gnostic and the Gnostics weren't around until the, the second century and so on and so But that's kind of begging the question. Yeah, I see. So you're hypothesizing that the, the Gnostic teachings might be quite original. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Richard Smoley, what a pleasure to explore these issues with you. I appreciate uh, the scholarship that you've put into these things. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you for being with me. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> ¶¶